record uh, before I forget, as I sometimes do. And I'll record your attendance real quick. Okay, um, so just let me know if you're here. Jack, Sadie, Fia, here, Nehemiah, Joseph is not here, Destery, Bennett. Donnie, Wyatt, Justin Gray, Tristan is here, Sam, still waiting on Joshua. Okay, Raven. Here. Eva. Jackie. Owen is here. Brianna. Michaela. Mac. B, Tyler, uh, Kai is here, Kala, James, Micah, here, Megan, here. And Ryan. All right. So we've got that taken care of. Oh, here's Joshua, he's waiting to get in. So <clears throat> let me go add him to the attendance for today. I'm here. Yeah, how's it going, Joshua? Going good, just had a math exam, so went over a little bit on that because it was pretty confusing, but I think I did okay. Math is confusing? All right. Calculus is confusing. It's not that too confusing. It's simple if you can visualize it, but the logistics are hard. Yeah. Yeah, I struggle with calculus myself. Um, all right, so uh, got a really small group today, so maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, to put you into small groups, but I don't know, I think maybe we'll do that anyway. <laughs> you can just have some really small groups. Because uh, I want to take some time to, to start uh, our session today uh, with some general discussion, as we usually do on Thursdays. And so uh, we actually began a number of these discussion threads, at least towards the end of our uh, class on Tuesday. And so I'll share the screen just real quick. And um, we'll take a look together at the threads for the discussion forum. Where are we? OK, yeah. All right. So having seen the outline for the group presentation today, so Joshua, thanks for sending that to me. Uh, I see that some of these questions are, are touched on or um, I'm anticipating will be touched on by the group presentation and discussion. Um, but the questions are, why does Hegel think artistic beauty? So remember, so far we've seen ways to distinguish, to make a distinction between artistic and natural beauty, um, or as Kant put it, 
artificial beauty versus natural beauty. So that would be the beauty of techne. Uh, and so sometimes in Aristotle, the technical arts of production are referred to as the artificial arts of production. And in the physics, uh, Aristotle's major work on material philosophy, um, in the physics, he, he distinguishes between natural substances and substances or presences in the world which are the product of, of human um, design or art, that is techne, and remember for Aristotle, and we've continued this definitional approach through several philosophers already, um, techne or art is best defined as something which is held or possessed in the conception of the artist prior to its realization in some uh, material medium. So the first question is, why does Hegel think artistic beauty occupies a higher place? So we'll have to make sense of what higher means here. It's ambiguous in contrast to natural beauty. And then do you agree with him or not? And then this is a question we began to talk about. And I actually pulled up an example of a recent work of art uh, that foregrounds the olfactory sense, so the sense of smell as if, if not everything to the work, an essential component to the work. So we'll, we'll have an opportunity to see uh, an oppositional view of the role of something like smell and art. But the question is, why according to Hegel are the senses of smell, taste, and touch, as he says on page 409, excluded from the springs of art's enjoyment, end quote. And do you think he's right? Do you know of any works of fine art in Hegel's sense? So I will later show you an example, but I'm, I wonder if, if you guys um, in your own familiarity with the art world and your experience have encountered any such examples yourselves. Um, so do you know of any works of fine art in Hegel's sense that make use of one or more of the excluded senses? So you have to be clear for this on what counts as fine art, how Hegel defines that. And then the last question, Hegel argues that through the historical expression of art, quote, the experience of our external life may be repaired of its deficiencies and the passions we share with all humans uh, may be excited, not merely that the experiences of life may not have us unmoved, but that we ourselves may thereafter long to make ourselves open channels of a universal experience. So that's sort of the crowning upshot of our reading for this week of, of what this romantic conception or theory of art amounts to. Um, and so we'll spend some time on that passage. And, and I imagine the presenters today might have some things to say about that too. Um, but I ask you, and this is what you can, if you choose to take on the third prompt in your discussion, to consider this by applying uh, this romantic idea of art to the work of, of one 19th century artist from chapter five. And so that's the chapter that has to do with 19th century art uh, in um, the bedside companion. So apply this way of thinking to one um, such work uh, or excuse me, one artist, I should say. So what truth does the art of that historical moment make manifest? Um, and so this is the sense in which for Hegel, art history, that is the collected um, works within the ongoing unfolding of the historical progress of art serves as a kind of repository or a storehouse of the manifestations of spirit at different stages of its uh, evolution. Uh, and so then we can look into the art historical world of the 19th century to gain a clear picture into the essential personality or character of that era. But we're not just concerned in doing that with gaining an understanding of who those people are, um, because that might only interest us if we have a sort of uh, um, fleeting or perhaps more consistent even interest or curiosity in such personages. But what's really important about that for us is um, seeing this historical moment in stark relief in terms of its underlying ideation as reflected in the sensuous materials of its artistic products can also see how we emerged historically as the people we are, say in the 21st century, out of that. Um, so that's kind of what this question is about. Um, 
So are there any questions about those questions, about the three questions or prompts of the discussion forum? Does it make sense? So I wanna give you guys just a little bit of time and breakout rooms to uh, take on, take up in your conversation at least one of those uh, questions. You don't have to do all of them. And of course we won't have time to do all of them, but I'm gonna make three breakout rooms so there are nine of you. So that means there'll be three in each room. So really small group discussions. Uh, so I look forward to, to hearing what you guys have to say. Um, so I'll give you about 10 minutes or so, and then um, I'll let you know when to start winding down your, your dialogue. So are there any, uh, any questions before I put you in the rooms? I miss real group discussions where you hear other people talking outside groups and have the teacher come and engage in the conversation and stuff like that. And when I do this in a real classroom, I'm actually walking around and I get to hear what you're saying and contribute and- uh, Yeah, it's fun. And it's not the best we can do, so. Um, all right, I'll send you into the rooms and then um, I'll let you know when to start winding it down. Oh, man. Zoom on the recording. All right. So uh, Kai, uh, when he came back from the breakout room, said he wanted to get us started addressing the, the first prompt. So question one. Um, yeah, so go ahead. All right, so through the first prompt, the main question we were discussing was why, um, like, why does Hegel believe there is more inherent value in artistic beauty than natural beauty? Upon like further in inspection, and I'm sure some groups have already discussed this before, um, before this, but I believe it's because Hegel is, Hegel believes that there is much more inherent value in a piece of art or a project when there is like a real, like a sense of inspiration or hard work behind behind it. Like natural beauty is definitely a real form of beauty, but it it just it just happens. Like people don't really have control over over like when uh, over like like what happens with it. So like the process, the inherent process is just some as of creating something to and to Hegel at least was something that made it more valuable. Okay, so what is it exactly about what the artist does? Because he notes, as you kind of pointed out just now, that the artist, he or she is always working with the material supplied by nature. But what is it about the artist's work with such materials um, that results in their elevation from their previous status as identified with mere nature? I think because it's because only I guess only technically only humans are capable of, of taking these otherwise like natural beauties and then evolving them with the um, um, past to like their old limits through their pieces of artwork. Okay, good. So there's a kind of evolution that takes. Yeah, place. like something start something starts just idle and then be, and then through uh, through actual like work and human effort, it, it eventually eventually can develop into something greater. And I guess to Hegel, that's what he defined as true beauty, the process of creating that beauty and then eventually developing into something that's just, that's pa past the original form. 
Yeah, so the original form has something um, in a strange sense incomplete because it stands forth in pure immediacy. It's yeah. given like, for our senses. Like there, like like just say like just say take like a like a seed then just growing it growing into a tree. Like I mean that tree, like that's something that uh, that occur that occurs in I mean that can occur naturally, you know, like I mean of course like someone could just just water the seed or grow grow it themselves, but through most cases that seed grows through just natural causes. Mm -hmm. But you know, just but I guess like the human process from Hegel's perspective is what makes the um, artistic beauty just far more valuable because there's there's a story behind it. There's a real deeper meaning behind it aside from just it was nature's will. So is it more valuable or is it more beautiful? Okay. <clears throat> Are we trying to find its intrinsic value or is its value like dependent on, on the beautiful as an aspect of like shining through it? Because I can see human creations holding more value to humans as just a matter of course. Yeah. But if we're gonna debate um, intrinsic beauty, I think like, no human could ever create a tree yeah. that is as good at being a tree as a tree. Uh, even if they genetically altered it, it would still do its own work, I guess. Yeah, like it starts from somewhere. Human, human beings like, may alter old pieces of natural beauty, but the beauty itself is not ultimately created by them. It doesn't originate mm -hmm. from them. Yeah, to connect to Owen's point that you just made, um, I mean, Hegel does, and this really comes out in the reading, the selection of our, of our reading for this uh, session for today. Um, so, and this can allow us as we did to some extent, Kant, it allow us to see how Hegel's theoretical approach to the nature of art and the aesthetic is different from that of the ancients. So we see him opposing, um, although he's obviously influenced by and drawing, drawing quite a bit in particular from Aristotle he rejects art as mimesis. <laughs> and so why, why, does he, why does he say that? Um, why should we not understand? However much a given artist is going to imitate natural, uh, even the content of natural forms in the external world, if that's all there is to art, then Hegel would, would conclude as he does that it isn't art at all. Um, and so what does he say about that? Does anyone, did anyone notice that in the text? Well, he was saying like, like nature is kind of like savagery. Like it's like, so far, it's like, so it's just a simple consciousness that's almost like, um, he definitely thinks that the, the human spirit has more complexity and intricacy and um, a, a variety of emotions and all kinds of things that nature doesn't possess. And so humans are more complex cognitive entities compared to nature being more simplistic. And he uses the word like savagery, I think, and he was describing nature. And so, yeah, the beauty of being higher is essentially just like, like humans could like put our, we could like mold things, we could create things similar to nature, but like we like put our spirit into things in a different way. And that spirit is able to be animated through these different objects and I don't know, something of that nature. I mean, it's a totally fair observation that the things humans make just wouldn't happen if there weren't humans. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a reason to hold them in a, a distinct regard to nature in general, I suppose. Um, not sure. I, I think my main disconnect is what makes it intrinsically higher. Yeah, so, I was, so on the one hand, and this is sort of what we've been emphasizing in our response to this question, the metaphysical, spiritual aspects in accordance with which the products of human design and art are superior. But Hegel also notes an undeniable sense of nature's own superiority that would make the effort of pure imitation on the part of a given artist utterly laughable, right? <laughs> So um, he starts to consider explicitly, directly, the mimetic conception of art on page 412, when he says, the principle of the imitation of nature, 
According to this view, the essential aim or object of art consists in imitation, by which is understood a facility in copying natural forms as present to us in a manner which shall most fully correspond to such facts. So the task of a painter understood mimetically in this, I would argue, reduced sense that isn't exactly appropriate um, in terms of what Aristotle was putting forth. The task of the painter is simply to reproduce as exactly or perfectly as possible whatever it is that they are imitating, whatever it is that they are participating in as an artist participates. Um, and then he talks about <laughs> the objection to such a thing on the part of the Turks on the opposing page, by which he means Muslims, right? He's talking about the Islamic opposition to representational or, or mimetic art. Um, and of course, we're all familiar with such objections when they come to representing Mohammed himself, but it extends more deeply than that. So he says, uh, when James Bruce in his travels through Abyssinia showed a painted fish to a Turk, um, a Muslim, he's not talking about a, a Turkish person who happens to be in Ethiopia, which is present day Abyssinia, that's just a name he's giving to Muslims. Um, uh, see, a painted fish. Um, so he was first astonished, but, but then quickly recovering himself, he made answer as follows. If this fish shall rise up against you at the last day and say, you have certainly given me a body, but no living soul, how are you going to justify yourself against such a complaint? <laughs> um, and then, let's see, the real upshot of this objection to imitative art comes at the end of that paragraph. So he says, in short, to sum up, we may state emphatically that in the mere business of imitation, art cannot maintain its rivalry with nature. So in the mere business of imitation, art cannot maintain its rivalry with nature. It's going to lose. Uh, and then he says, and if it makes the attempt, it must look like a worm which undertakes to crawl after an elephant. <laughs> so if as a landscape artist, your entire enterprise is predicated on your capacity to perfectly duplicate the very scene before you, well, obviously as a painter, you're gonna do so in a two dimensional form and you're going to have to make interpretive decisions as to what to emphasize in your pictorial representation and therefore what to de-emphasize. Uh, and so you're not gonna be able to, to capture uh, the uh, indescribable, inexhaustible depth of the original scene as an artist in your efforts to imitate it. So if that's all you're trying to do, your very enterprise has failed from the start. It's abortive by its very nature. Um, so he's saying, if that's all art is about, well, then we needn't even talk about it anymore. It's not even interesting. It's not even a worthwhile component of the historical evolution of Geist or spirit as he's describing it. So this is a kind of argument he's making. Uh, if we do think it's worthwhile, if we do think it's somehow expressive of an essential dimension of, of reality as we know it in terms of human consciousness, then there has to be something more to art than just the slavish, uh, sort of um, commitment to perfectly representing visual or whatever uh, forms. And so does that make sense? Yeah. So, I'm oh, sorry. I was gonna say, isn't it like part of it too, like he's, I think it was early in the, the last reading, he's talking about how like how boundless the human mind is in contrast to nature. That's like one up for the human higher cognitive faculties is that we can imagine things that don't exist and implement them within the textures of art. Now, obviously he did kind of go back and say like, yeah, nature has like, yeah, he kind of goes back on forth on arguing for nature or for the human and which one's the higher, but he doesn't even conclude that the human mind is higher. Yeah, so we shouldn't be misled here on the one hand, and there's no tension here. There's no contradiction or opposition. It's not as if he's working through an argument in an operative sense, not yet knowing where he's going to conclude, right? So on the one hand, he's saying, um, the power of nature in its uh, excessive variability of form and content 
so far goes beyond human technical capabilities that if we were attempt to approximate it as close as possible, we would be far away from the wellspring of nature's very physical sources. There's nothing we could do to compete. So on the one hand, that might seem to suggest that nature is superior, but what are these forms that an imitative artist would like to capture and represent? What is going on in nature? Well, we're dealing with pure sensuous materiality, which is necessarily an in itself. Remember the Hegelian vocabulary. It is immediate and in itself, and thus in its very material sensuousness does not participate in an active way in the ongoing evolution of spirit. That requires the intervention on the part of a subject. Yet when the artist or any human individual as a consciousness confronts material nature and recognize say a tree or a flower or a stone to go back to the boulder in the path example, they say here is a boulder, here is a flower, here is a stone. And really before I can even make those determinate judgments or observations on what I'm experiencing, I am more essentially, more immediately saying, here am I, I am consciousness, and then here is something which is other than consciousness. Here is something which is other than me. So there is a rift, there is a kind of split between self-consciousness as a member of spirit, as an example individually of a spirit. And in the reading, he describes God as a spirit too. Um, and then just some pure immediacy, some pure sensuous immediacy, which in itself, as a being in itself, as opposed to who we are, beings for themselves, is um, brute and mute. It is effectively meaningless and we find it dissatisfying. And so this is sort of the originary impulse or motivation from which the entire um, artistic enterprise unfolds. Uh, we see this thing that is other, and as consciousness, we cannot stand, we cannot abide for this presence to remain other, to remain alien. So we make the effort of appropriating it into the ongoing process of living consciousness itself, the evolutionary growth of spirit coming to know itself. And art is one way through which that happens. We come, spirit comes to know itself through its iterative appropriation of material nature, which happens in a different sense in this or that historical epoch. Um, and the way in which one historical epoch, so we can talk about that in terms of art history or the development of religious traditions or of the progress of science and philosophy, it's not arbitrary, right? So one tradition or approach grows out of another through this kind of dialectical unfolding. Um, and that's really the ongoing process of spirit coming to fulfill itself. Um, so does that make sense? <laughs> How he can say on the one hand that uh, nature has such a variable reach, an inexhaustible plenum to it, that it remains bottomless and it is of such fecund um, subtle detail that human beings can't possibly replicate it. But nevertheless, we have a desire to replicate it. But in reduplicating or representing these natural forms, it's not that that's the end goal. That's not exactly what we're up to. Because if we were up to that, we would fail every time. And to the extent that we're capable of achieving it to some extent, it would be ultimately laughable. And that's, <laughs> so this is one of my favorite parts of the text on page 414. Um, so maybe one or, or more of you noticed this, but he talks about uh, a famous encounter of Alexander the Great in someone. So somebody has perfected the ability to take, you know, a little bean, a lentil, and to throw it through a tiny hole, a tiny aperture, perfectly every time. So they could sit, you know, five or six feet away from this tiny little hole with a little bean, throw it, and it goes through. And the guy was so happy with himself <laughs> at this ability that he was like, I got to show the emperor. Alexander's in town. Like, come see this. And he exhibits his prowess. He shows his great skill. 
And as a reward, what does Alexander do? What does he give him? A bushel of lentils. <laughs> He's like, pats him on the head, basically. Good job, here you go. Here's a bag of more lentils. <laughs> so you can continue throwing them through this tiny hole. Um, so he's comparing that to the artist who strives um, developing great technical skill to imitate natural forms and perhaps achieving that to a strong and admirable degree. If that's all there is to it, well, it's just like someone who has developed through practice the ability to throw a bean through a minuscule hole. <laughs> it's impressive, I guess, but in the end, what does it amount to? It doesn't really mean much. Um, except to exemplify the way in which spirit has appropriated nature, has achieved the capacity to perceive itself in it and to perceive nature in it, such that the gap, the rift, the tear that separates consciousness from materiality from, uh, between spirit and nature is repaired. That fracture has been mended. Um, okay, so... Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, that's why I was saying I want Hegel as my dad, because I feel like I'm sensuous in general in my life. I'm kind of like just existing. I need to get more spirit involved into like animating the things around me because I'm just like pretty dull most of the time. Like, how do you do it? How do you make things pretty beyond just like things, but like, you know, everything? But. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. I tend to make things ugly, so I can't answer that. <laughs> Um, yeah, but so uh, what about some of the other prompts? Did anyone want to talk about those before we take a break and then get into the presentation? I don't know about y'all, but it was a um, dangerously like attractive prompt, the first one <laughs> for our group. Um, but I do believe that beyond the um, this sort of like shock of placing humans above nature for our modern like interpretations of, of such things, um, it does play into his overall philosophy on art as is like questioned in um, the other two prompts. Like there is something about the way humans abstract nature into these greater ideas that is admirable and i i mean i would never deny that i'm not entirely sure what i'm gonna write about it but there's certainly a lot to discuss today yeah yeah so i, I found it finally i was gonna so to add to that just to 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 go back to that first prompt and that's all we need to talk about um we don't have to get into the others in, in uh, the interest of time, but on page 383, so really close to the very start of our reading, he says, uh, and this is in the middle of that second full paragraph, in predicating of mind and its artistic beauty a higher place in contrast to nature, we do not denote a distinction which is merely relative. So he's not saying uh, this isn't a quantitative difference or a difference by degree, such that nature is doing all this cool shit and then um, uh, by some infinitesimal next step, we get humans uh, and whatever it is that we're capable of. He says mind, and that's a translation, by the way, of geist. So geist is, is alternatively translated as spirit or mind, depending on the context. So geist and geist alone, mind and mind alone is pervious to truth. So pervious meaning um, impervious is a more typical word. Uh, impervious means you're not affected by. So geist or mind alone is pervious to truth. We are capable of, of you might say, enacting truth, participating in the very process, the disclosure of truth. So recall truth in the Greek sense um, of aletheia, uncovering, unhiddenness. It's only through mind or geist that that very unhiddenness is possible. So mind and mind alone is pervious to truth, 
comprehending all in itself, so that all which is beautiful can only be veritably beautiful, so truly beautiful, as partaking in this higher sphere and as begotten of the same. And then he goes on to talk about something as, <laughs> as um, magnificent and powerful, overwhelming, in fact, as the sun. Um, however great the sun is, it pales <laughs> in comparison to the um, epistemic and metaphysical powers of mind or Geist, because the sun is, however momentous it might be, and essential for the functioning of the cosmos, or at least of our solar system, it is a being in itself, not a being for itself, which means it has self-coincidence. There is no gap, as it were, through which, as a kind of space or opening, consciousness can deploy itself and be conscious of something. And when you are conscious of something, you are noting implicitly or explicitly a space of separation between you, the being who is conscious and that of which you are conscious. So it's in that very space of difference between consciousness and that of which it's conscious, all of material nature, that the very process of truth through which, for example, science is possible in the first place, um, opens up. Um, okay, so is that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The last comment for me for before the break is, I wish we could redo all of our classes over the last year, once we're like back in class, so I can get the full girth of the offering from, you know, the lectures and stuff. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Like kind of wasted so it's like I'm, I'm really really into it but it's like it's just a weird like i'm in my room you know <laughs> i'm alone in my sad little office here on campus um okay but actually before we yeah before we take a, a quick break um i just wanted to show because this is an important and it's it's really not explicitly a part of our reading from the introduction to these lectures on aesthetics. It's just mentioned uh, in the editors of this edited volumes um, opening introduction. So uh, the difference between um, these historical kinds of art. So I just wanted to show these three slides and then we'll take a quick break. Um, so, in some, so there's symbolic art, classical art, and um, romantic art, which is what develops in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, so in symbolic art, an outward material form manifests indirectly some hidden spiritual sense or meaning. So through all this, there is the dichotomy between ideality, that is an ideal content, and then, because we're dealing with art, some sensuous material form through which that content is presented. And so that's what differentiates what's possible in terms of all these historical art forms. Uh, but in the case of symbolic art, this ideal content is too abstract, too vague, or too indeterminate. It's too general. It's too free-flowing. Uh, to fit, as it were, the sensuous presentation. So here's a quotation from the text uh, showing the pyramids of Egypt, which are for, Her for Hegel paradigmatic of symbolic art. So the pyramids of Egypt are enormous crystals. I really love this language. The pyramids of Egypt are enormous crystals which secrete <laughs> an inwardness. They're like oozing this inwardness, this spirit uh, within them. And they so enclose an external form, which is the product of art, that we are made aware that they stand there for this very inward in its separation from the mere actuality of nature and that their entire significance depends on that relation. So can anyone say just very briefly what he means by symbolic art and, and how these pyramids exemplify that? So what's going on in the relationship between the ideal content and the sensuous form in the case of these pyramids? Yeah. 
is it in the mystery that the pyramids present as like being hidden somewhere within or underneath them? Yeah, so you see, I mean, imagine the first people because we're seeing here the vestiges of a lost civilization, right? So imagine people who were traveling and they come to see these uh, from a foreign land or something. Um, it's clearly the work of art. It's clearly the product of some intentional design and technical manipulation. These pyramids did not just emerge from the earth as geograph geological forces produce mountains or as trees emerge from the ground and so forth. So um, there is, as is the case for all works of art, some purpose, in other words, some ideal involved, but precisely what that ideal entails is left open. It's indeterminate, it's a mystery. Uh, so there is some spiritual striving, some ideal content that is trying to manifest itself. It is trying um, to, uh, exemplify and model, let's say, its universality within a sensuous form, um, which is the character of all art, the essential character of all art. But it, it's, um, there's something that doesn't quite fit because you don't know what's going on here. Um, it's symbolic. It seems to be pointing to something, but you don't know exactly to what it's pointing. So um, the idea doesn't fit the materiality. It's too vague. Uh, to actually, let's say, in a spiritual way, the ideal content to punch through uh, from within that external form to speak itself in any clearly impactful register. But now contrast that with classical art, which is paradigmatically given in the form of sculpture. So in classical art, um, such as in ancient Greek sculpture, uh, also Roman sculpture, there's some ideal spiritual content that's realized through the sensual medium of marble, stone, and whatever, but it's perfectly adequate to it. So whereas in symbolic art, the ideal form isn't enough, it's too weak or vague or indeterminate for the sensuous materiality to do any impactful truth-making with it, to set it forth in its truthfulness, but when it comes to classical art, the ideal content and the material form through which that content is realized are commensurate with each other. They're on the same level. So this sculpture, and this is uh, a pedimental sculpture from uh, the temple of Athea and Agina. Um, so from this particular period, so um, the fifth century, fourth century BCE, this sculpture represents in three-dimensional material form, a warrior. So think about that, why uh, the form is commensurate with the content. The content is some historical human being who lived at a different time and was engaged in a battle. The sculpture, unlike say a painting, is also three-dimensional. <laughs> so the form really gives you the, uh, in the dimensions too, the proper quantitative dimensions of the presence of a human body as a form, it gives it to you. You could walk around and see all the different sides of it. Um, who despite having fallen, so this warrior, remains engaged in the struggle. You can see him striving to get up <laughs> even as his leg is apparently broken off. Um, thus we see these Greek spiritual values of honor, heroism, agon, which is uh, translatable to struggle or competition, presented to the senses and frozen in time, like a snapshot, such that thousands of years later, we can see that spirit still preserved. Um, but also we can see this sense of our finitude, that is the inevitability of death preserved here for us to consider in such a way that it's given in what we understand to be a mere semblance. If we happen upon a legitimate corpse, so an actual dead body, we're not gonna philosophically muse, at least at first, about the nature of human finitude and the reality of the death that awaits us. We're gonna think, shit, I wonder what happened to this guy. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, does anyone know there's a dead body here? Um, 
But when you see a sculpture, you have the distance that enables you to philosophically reflect on something that owing to the immediacy of sensuousness stands in the way of that. Um, so this is a sense in which for Hegel, although art is fictitious, it's illusory in some sense because there isn't really a dying man here. Um, he points out that there is semblance there is a kind of illusory character to reality itself. Natural phenomena show themselves, but we're always too caught up in the scope and grip of those sensuous presentations to bring them to the full level of spiritual consciousness. But it's that very thing that art facilitates and enables. Uh, does that make sense? And so lastly, romantic art. And so some of you, has anybody seen this painting before? It's a pretty famous romantic painting from the 19th century, Caspar David Friedrich. Uh, it really gives you an image pointing now back to Kant, to Kantian um, aesthetics, an image of the sublime, right? Uh, so what is the sublime? Well, the sublime, is one's subjective confrontation with the overwhelming chaos or violence of nature, but in such a way that you are safe from it. <laughs> so the character presented here is looking down on just the immensity of this valley, um, which gives you a kind of vertigo or terror, but he's secure enough in his distance from it and his stability on this rock uh, that he can derive some kind of enjoyment or pleasure from it. Um, so that's really what Kant means by the sublime versus the beautiful. And Caspar uh, David Friedrich gives us an image of that, a representation of that. But it's really strange because sublimity suggests enormity, greatness, overwhelmingness. But, and you can't pick this up from this uh, copy of the painting, but Friedrich's paintings are actually quite small, which is really strange. So this particular painting, I think, is just like this big, <laughs> if you were to see it on a gallery wall. Um, but in romantic art, the relationship found in symbolic art between ideal content and material form is reversed. So remember, in symbolic art, the ideal content is too little for the material form. And in classical art, the uh, ideal content and the material or sensuous form are on the same level. But now with romantic art, the ideal content is too much for the sensuous form to bear or to clearly or satisfactorily communicate. Uh, so the spiritual values made manifest for sensuous experience are too deep and sophisticated to be adequately captured in material form. So a kind of tension is introduced by the presentation, inciting the mind to travel beyond it. So beyond what's given in this painting, in a free and open-ended reverie. So spirit is now so evolved in this historical progression that art fails to articulate the ideal content that it aspires to, whereas that was a perfectly plausible capacity for the ancient Greek artists and sculptors. So romantic art, like Friedrich's painting here, shows a growing inwardness and self-reflection on the part of humanity as expressed in the religious sphere. So remember, religion is one of those three major domains through which spirit evolves alongside art and philosophy and science, um, expressed in the religious sphere through the, through the development of Christianity. So unlike the deities of the Greek pantheon, the Christian God conceived in terms of the Holy Trinity, for example, cannot be adequately represented in physical form. And for the, the Turk, <laughs> as Hegel puts it, or the Muslim, that's in fact a major uh, moral transgression to even attempt to depict uh, the divine in some material presence or sensuously given form. Um, thus, any effort towards this end serves only to direct one in thought. So any effort to represent the unrepresentable, and that's one way to put romantic art, Romantic artists strive to represent what cannot be represented or to present what cannot be presented. And so that serves to direct or point your thought beyond the failed image towards the inexhaustible source of the spiritual as such, which cannot be captured 
and any particular image. And this is why Hegel thinks that the time for arts, um, hierarchical centrality, its deep importance with respect to the evolution of spirit is a thing of the past. Um, so now, for example, we turn to religion um, or even more so in the 21st century, uh, obviously science for truth rather than art. Um, okay. So is that, does that make sense, what these three periods of art are doing? Any questions about that? It does make sense generally, but just to clarify the difference between symbolic and romantic art, because it seems like in both uh, pieces, the sort of ideal content is too large for the form. Well, that's the case for the so romantic. what exactly? So that's the case for the romantic. Okay, maybe I misunderstood you in relation to the symbolic. Then. Okay, so the symbolic art, it's the material, um, sensuous form side that's too much. So imagine those who put forth these uh, architectural um, products. So for example, the pyramids, they have some meaning. As spirit, they're trying to manifest themselves through the shaping of external nature. So they're pounding away at this rock, but in the end, it kind of just looks like a triangular rock. <laughs> and that's all they're able to do with it. So that stone really remains impervious to the effort driving towards truth on the part of the inward spiritual content. Does that make sense? So on the, in symbolic art, it's the ideal content, the spiritual side, that's too weak or too vague, and it's the material side that's too strong and too heavy. But then when we transition or evolve to the romantic period, it's completely inverted. So now it's the, the ideal content that's too much. And this is why um, painting and music, for example, are paradigmatic of, of um, romantic art. So we're no longer trying to imitate, say, three-dimensional forms through sculpture. We're trying to get at something that can't be captured in any um, sensuous way, three-dimensional or not. So we have two-dimensional images which point beyond themselves, and they thus fall short of what it is that they're trying to represent. OK, so I'm checking out. There's some cool stuff going on in the chat. Uh, yeah, resin art. Yeah, I'm not sure what Hegel would think of resin art. <laughs> um, but let me see what Raven shared so I have a sense of what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, so I'm at, was it the pyramid that made you think of that, <laughs> Raven? I was actually thinking of that beforehand when you're talking about nature and like preserving it and how nature can only create itself. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what Hegel will think about that. But uh, in the interest of time, so we don't, we have like, uh, not that much time left. So <laughs> let's take just a quick break and then we'll come back uh, for our presenters to, to walk us through whatever they want to share. Um, so let's just take a few minutes. Um, I'm going to run to the restroom and then I'll see you guys in just a few. I'll zoom the recording now. All right. Um, okay, hopefully we're all back now. Um, so we've got our presenters and uh, well, at least three of the four who are scheduled to present. And so um, you guys, you have the floor and now go ahead. Uh, do I need to share my host status with you? Are you gonna use any? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think we're just talking today. Oh, all right, so yeah, go ahead. So beginning where, uh, the, effectively in the very beginning of the, the reading for today, essentially is he, he begins with a question of where where does art originate from in, in the sense of humanity? What is what what drives us all to do art? What is our universal compulsion? And the, the he draws, like we were discussing with the nature, that man is 
essentially a part of nature, but at the same time, through his consciousness, he draws a distinction between himself and nature. And in that he tries to uh, describe himself, I wanna say in that respect. So in his compulsion to make art, it's that he wants to take a piece of his spirit, of his soul and place it into the more natural world in maybe a way that is perhaps for introspective reasons and a way to show the agency of an individual. He, he gives the example Hegel of uh, a boy throwing a stone into a stream and uh, that the joy that goes along with that and showing the, how his actions can affect, affect the world uh, around us. Uh, yeah, he says, uh, this purpose he achieved by the alteration he effects in such external objects upon which he imprints the seal of his inner life, rediscovering in them thereby the features of his own determinate nature. So in, in that respect, it's, it's learning something about yourself. It's sort of introspective, yet it's productive at the same time since you sort of know what the natural world is and yet you're imbuing it with a piece of yourself. But of course, that's not the only... Uh, criteria for uh, what makes something art. Uh, he also uh, requires it to be of a sensuous medium and uh, seems reasonable to consider that, uh, or he, he brings up that not all the sensuous mediums are created equal, that the, he only likes the, the sight and the hearing as they are the, the theoretical senses, the ones that are effectively communicative and that sort of thing and that the the other senses while they can allow us to perceive pleasure in that respect don't have that same communicative nature and um, information bearing nature and I don't really understand his justification for all this to be perfectly clear but it's it's like art holds some middle ground between its material existence and its sensuous nature and that those those other senses can't meet that middle ground in that same respect. Although I do wonder if maybe a, a, like a total combination of those senses could in some way uh, uh, bring about the, the theoretical senses if it's using all three of them at once per simultaneously or something like that. Or, but then there's also things like culinary uh, arts, which we certainly consider art mm -hmm. usually, but uh, there, there's a highly visual element as well to uh, the food. So that adds another wrinkle in those sorts of uh, things. Um, there is art not being imitative and mimetic as we've sort of discussed. He, he breaks with the, our, our Greek friends in that respect and uh, doesn't. Uh, awesome, thank you, Tristan. That yeah. was really great. Yeah, and so then kind of like, you know, you kind of really laid out like what is art, how he used to define art and different ways he would kind of quantify art and how he wouldn't quantify it. And then he kind of, you know, then there in the section he talks about like, we were talking about the mimic aspect of art, how it's, he doesn't see that to be art, like uh, I think Plato or Aristotle said before, but he kind of draws it, the attention to, there's like throughout the text, he kind of, it's, he's at, um, he, kind of is trying to bridge the connection between the individual consciousness uh, being aware of itself and being different than the sensuous uh, thing, which is nature. And so the soul of man and the distinction he draws between himself and nature for which he himself is a part and drawing this distinction, man seeks to imbue objects around him with a piece of spiritual essence. This purpose he achieved by alteration he affects in such external objects upon which he imprints the seal of his inner life, rediscovering in them thereby the feature of his own determined nature, page 401. So he's kind of like giving agency to these objects and giving them like bringing life to things around him and just saying that that's like important part of being, uh, it's, it's like, it's a word conundrum where like you're acknowledging that the world is made of art and to some capacity and like what I gathered from it was, um, let me get my thoughts. What I gathered from it was there's like art 
is not just like a luxury like we talked about in the previous section. It's like fundamental to everything. And we are our conscious or unconscious artists. My computer is about to die. So let me plug that in. <laughs> and so, and so like by being conscious of the fact that we are generative and that we put our spirit into things that we are powerful at the spiritual level that we are aware and conscious of that, of our innate ability as human, we can create things that bring more joy, life, vitality, everything. And so it's like, I think I take it as like a life lesson, like he's trying to teach us, but it's really obviously explicit to the fine arts, but I think there is some analogies you could draw for other aspects of life. And so I'm kind of in a unique place where, you know, I'm a dad, I have a wife that I have to entertain, provide for, I have to do the whole show, the whole shindig, I have to go to school, I have to go work. Like, I'm just trying to find that for myself. So I'm just looking for it for anywhere I can, like, how do I make this work? So I think Hegel talks about how you can make it work and it's through that spiritual higher cognitive capacity that I don't really, isn't connect all the way or else to be able to explain it better, but I want to connect so I can actually do it, which is like, how do I bridge that powerful creative force of being an artist, of creating art, of understanding art and use those principles into my life. And then, you know, so then on uh, page 414, if imitation were the only aim of art, then beauty would be irrelevant as it would be subservient to accuracy. And so that's where he kind of just validates like the logic aspects of is like, oh, I need to get a job, make money, then we'll all be happy. But it's like, no, you have to make things wholesome and happy. You have to like bring that quality to make you happy. And if the principles, uh, okay, in this, where is it? Uh, in as much as, well, that's not it. Well, I mean, it's in as much moreover, the principle of imitation is purely formal, objective beauty itself disappears. In as much moreover, the principle of imitation is purely formal, objective beauty itself disappears. That principle is accepted as the end, for the question is no longer what it is the constitution of that which is imitated by simply whether the copy is correct or not. Uh, so what is art about? It's about exploring humanity. I could uh, jump in here, actually. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to bring up the, the, go back a minute for right above where that quote was to the, the story of the Turk again, because I think that's an interesting uh, a concept to think about, especially, I mean, I think it works for his analogy that if, you know, if there, there's something lacking, you'll never truly be able to represent the fish. But I think it's interesting that um, his representation of Islamic iconoclasm, and that's not the right word, but I'm going to use it there anyway, um, is like, is, is interpreting it that way? Because I've always interpreted that more to be a, a thing about avoiding idolatry, which is like the exact opposite problem of the, the, the the depiction of the fish would be so wonderful as you might treat it as some sort of god, which I, I thought was amusing since he's using it as almost the exact opposite of what I would have interpreted it as. And that's sort of interesting in that respect. But so he's he's denied that art is inherently mimetic. So so what is art actually about? It's it's about exploring humanity. It's about taking the human spirit and it's it's experiencing it and it's sense it's feeling and it's uh, powers of emulation and he says it's its object is therefore declared to be that of arousing and giving life to slumbering emotions inclinations passions of every description of filling the heart up to the brim to pass through all that the human soul carries in its most intimate and mysterious chambers so it is this exploration of humanity which of course immediately connects to the the third, third prompt that we have this week, which I don't have the quote off the top of my head there, but the, the one where it's exploring the, the deficiencies of humanity and seeing that through the art of the, the bits and pieces of the past that are uh, beneficial, that are useful in that respect, and that we can synthesize with this whole dialectic thing. So. Uh, he says that ultimately that art is the ultimate instructress. I don't remember where he says that, but he does say it. And I, I think that that really sums it up together that it's an instructing force. Yeah, absolutely. I want to jump into you think pretty much like this, like the academic world of fine arts it, by the nature of its precision, it's, it's restrained kind of limits it from its highest expression of art. So there's like a benefit to like practicing fine, like not fine, but practicing, uh, technical art skills, but he's saying like that there's the higher art is outside of that. And, um, and, and he's kind of 
at the end of the reading from it was talking about nature and basically like what you're just saying about the the nature of art then separate of like how it's different than nature and um basically kind of we already said it but i'll say it one more time this is my how i wrote it nature has its own intelligence and one cannot put its cognitive touch within nature or in other words one cannot express their own consciousness through nature nature is of its own art is a way to uh, we come to understand ourselves and helps us achieve transmission of our animation into other objects and reflect our own self-consciousness through these objects. Nature doesn't help us achieve this sort of omni-consciousness that we can once we create art through mediums of sensuous and objects. And so, yeah, it's kind of like just a dialogue we kind of had and kind of wrote it out. And so John, yeah. that point that you were just making, it's really important. I was wondering if you could connect it to um, <clears throat> That passage that you were going over before uh, Tristan um, shared with yeah. his last thoughts. Okay. Um, yeah. So the in as much as moreover the principle of oh yeah uh -huh. so yeah to connect those two would be like you know what you're saying with like the worm and the elephant like we cannot possibly replicate nature so that's like it to make that the end goal would be uh, as you put it meaningless. And so like we have this, this whole part was like, what is art? That's, that's what this was about. It's like, how do we like, this is what this whole class is about, I guess, is like, how do we come to understand art and what do we view it as true? And of course the augurs ideal ideas and ideals, but um, yeah, so that, I think that's what connects it. And if we were to simply copy nature, it'd just be a copy and that would be it. And there would, that'd be over. So to make something art is to like have that experience of putting yourself into something kind of coping with your emotions, coping with your thoughts and feelings and like having like representations of your inner working unfolds, like yourself kind of comes open and is expressed through your surroundings. And that the outside gives you the reflection inside. So like when I do art, like it's just like, oh, my favorite fighter or like different signs or symbols or do draw doodle doodle. And it's kind of like my inner workings expressed. And so it's, you know, like obviously no one would probably appreciate it besides me or someone that knows me well, like, oh, and that's what's on. Josh's mind, cars and fighters and random BS, but um, it's what's on my mind, so it's beautiful, I guess. <laughs> uh, can I add on to that? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that with that point. And like, imagine if you worked like really hard on just a, a certain project and you thought it was like the, the best piece you'd ever done, and yet just other people with no context as to how much work you put into it, or who just didn't understand the topic, just kind of went like, Ugh, I don't like. What? what is this like perhaps there is no way for people to truly understand artwork and artwork in the end if they haven't lived through that experience themselves mm -hmm. so that also is a question like who's actually qualified to judge any of the art he he talks about that briefly he's basically saying like uh it has to be like you have to kind of was in, it has to be connected it has to be kind of a shared experience what makes it attractive and beautiful is like that's connected with the other people so I guess there's like more broad art <laughs> inclusive of others and the people that are included would appreciate it if they have a sense of nostalgia of what you're doing or there's a connection to what you're doing because that's a way to kind of connect yourself with others. So even if they don't yeah. have a connection with it personally, just connecting with you and connecting with is yeah. a connection. I believe that just, you know, just like very much like life, like the main draw from creating art is the process and really just the journey towards making it. It's not really the destination. Yeah, and so, so when you end up with that final product, which gets preserved, you can encounter through art history, for example, gaining access to this repository of the iterative steps of spirit's advance. Um, you, uh, through your relation to the object as a viewer, as an experiencer of art, you re-enliven it. Um, and so, to the extent that it no longer speaks to you. And this is something that Benedetto Croce will talk about. Uh, so after next week, once we finish with the midterm, we'll get into the expressivist or expressionist um, theory of art uh, on the part of Croce. And Croce was a neo-Hegelian uh, from Italy. So we'll be kind of continuing. Oh no, actually we're doing Nietzsche before Croce, I'm sorry. So we're kind of doing Nietzsche and then Croce, but keep that in mind uh, for I guess it's week eight um, when we come to the expressivism theory of art. Uh, if it doesn't speak to you, then the form is dead and spirit is no longer alive there. And so there is no, strictly speaking, art because there is no expression 
or communication happening. But uh, to go back to that passage though, just really quickly, because this is a, a, another important point about the problem of mimesis from the point of view of Hegel. Um, if art was essentially imitative and that's what it's all about, then all that would matter is the accurate representation of the model being imitated. Yet we do care about what we imitate. <laughs> so it's not neutral. I mean, you could, for example, uh, you have a, a dead battery in your car. So you go to AutoZone, you buy a new car battery. Now you have a receipt. So now you sit down and you take hours and you replicate that receipt. You make an awesome fucking painting of your receipt from AutoZone. <laughs> and you're like, look at this, uh, everyone. And, and they might first mistake it for a receipt. And you're like, no, 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 this is a work of art. And then you, you might respond like Alexander did to the dude with the lentils, like, great, <laughs> what do I care? So it's not just um, the imitation, it's the object. So that's why he says, if, if the principle of imitation is purely formal, then objective beauty disappears because beauty isn't just a matter of representation, it's also a matter of the content of that representation. Um, so it's not indifferent to us as artists and consumers of art, viewers of art, what it is that we're engaging with in the sensuous form. Um, so that's why in art history, there have been periods where they're dedicated obsessively to painting like great historical figures or painting landscapes or painting weird still life <laughs> arrangements, right? Um, okay, so does that make sense? Well, I just... Okay. Um, yeah, so go ahead. I didn't want to take over. You have more to say there. Uh, I just wanted to, to make that final point about imitation. Well, yeah, I guess I was kind of, we kind of skipped around a bunch, but Hegel says that fine art must be free in its aim and means in order for art to be free, it has to be operating as a modality of thought. When art is free in its aim and means, it becomes a medium of thought. One of the three modes and forms, art, religion, philosophy, through which uh, our most profound interests in spiritual truths are grasped and expressed by consciousness. Um, so I think that's like kind of like the, um, the contrary to art being, you know, me mimic in nature is that for his definition, art has to be free. Uh, and that's what he's saying is one of the foundations of art, religion, philosophy is the uh, modality of thought. And yeah, it's pretty crazy how spiritual truths, consciousness, thought, and all these things are kind of synonymous with art in some capacity. Maybe not synonymous, but like they are related to one degree away, which is really hard to kind of comprehend. I only comprehend it at certain moments through readings where I'm like, oh, there it is. But it's like, it fades away so quick where it's like, I forget it. It's interesting. We have some questions. Um, I don't know my printer didn't it print off everything. That's why I'm kind of cycling through this. Maybe look at my Word document. So questions, questions. Uh, so. So I guess I don't have them. Maybe Tristan can help me out here. Do you have questions you're going to pose to the class? Oh, yeah, just some conversations of like, I guess it's kind of more like, uh, what does, what is that kind of the conclusion of this reading being, uh, what what does Hegel kind of come to as a conclusion for what does he view art as, or what is the proper mode of art to achieve the highest, uh, highest form? Does anyone want to jump in there? <laughs> it's well, really I'll put my money on Owen will answer. <laughs> 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 if, I were, if I were a betting man. <laughs> how much are how much are we talking? How, how much would you bet? Um, I'm not a money better. I'm a, a sure paper better. <laughs> what about, I mean, 
we can ask some questions together. So uh, what about the weird Latin phrase from the- oh, uh, I wrote that down as a question. It was actually one of them. Where is it? Nihil hamani e mi alunim om puto. I was gonna look that up. In Spanish, puto is not a great word, but yeah. <laughs> Nothing human is alien to me. Yeah. That was a question I had, but I answered it. Sorry. Why is he? What's the purpose of of situating his his reflections on art around this uh, strange Latin phrase? Seems like the importance of art as reflective of the human experience is present there. Yeah, so that almost sort of references the inner subjectivity of uh, Kant, and it comes right after talking about uh, the capacity of art to sort of ameliorate difficult emotional uh, experiences like grief. He talks about how a widow or uh, having grievers at a, a funeral. Who were, who were crying and sort of giving uh, an objective quality to the pain that the family is feeling and thereby allowing them to sort of um, identify this feeling as outside of themselves and then reflect on it and sort of cope with it. Good, good, yeah. So, um, I mean, that's really, so that's interesting to connect to what we were talking about before, the presenters were talking about before in terms of semblance or appearance. So obviously there's semblance and appearance given in representational art at least. Um, and it's a fictive or illusory semblance or appearance. So think about the painted fish. So it's the formal presentation of what a fish looks like, but it's abstracted from life, it's abstracted from any um, living worldly environmental context. Um, but what happens there? You're able to engage with the reality of nature behind the semblance of the fish, seeing it painted or depicted before your vision in a way that you wouldn't when it comes to fish that are swimming about in the river that you are aiming to capture for your dinner <laughs> or something like that. Um, and so I, I, in the, the slides I used, I'll just pull up um, the slide real quick to share this particular image. Um, so I think it's helpful for this. So this is a painting from uh, 1914 of Francisco Goya. Um, so let me share the screen real quick. So on page 390, so just to connect this to Hegel's argument in the text, he says, in comparison with the appearance of immediate sensuous existence and that of historical narration, the show of art, so the appearance, the semblance of art possesses the advantage that in its own virtue, it points beyond itself, directing us to a somewhat spiritual, which it seeks to envisage to the conceptive mind. Immediate appearance on the contrary, does not give itself out to be thus elusive, but rather to be the true and real, though as a matter of fact, such truth is contaminated and obstructed by the immediately sensuous medium. The hard rind of nature and the everyday world offer more difficulty to the mind in breaking through to the idea than do the products of art. So I note here that idea means the ultimate showing, that is to say truth of reality. Um, and so insofar as that showing is the work of human technical, or I should say artistic beauty, creative beauty, it's the idea that is the ultimate truth of reality brought out in sensuous appearance. So paradoxically, um, uh, the illusory or fictitious world of the arts is more real, Hegel's arguing, than is our everyday experience. And so um, I didn't mention this before, but uh, Hegel described philosophy itself as the inverted world. <laughs> so when we're doing philosophy, we're participating in the inverted world. That is the world turned upside down in accordance with what's 
um, understood in virtue of our typical everyday experience. So for example, we take the hard uh, reality of the external world that we navigate in our everyday lives to be real and then what we encounter through artistic productions as somehow, especially if we approach this from the mimetic point of view, uh, falsified representations or at least secondary representations. Um, but this is false. He's saying there's something really abstract about everyday reality that is fulfilled, that's uh, brought to fruition in true sense or meaning or reality through art. So think of this painting by Goya. So this is commemorating a real event, uh, the 3rd of May in 1908, um, in which there was a bloody massacre, right? After a riot, um, there was some social unrest and people were, were shot in the street, right? It was a horrific um, uh, world event, world historical event. And if you were a part of that event, you wouldn't be able to see the truth of it. Just like going back to that fallen Greek soldier, if you're on the battlefield, you're too much in the thick of the moment, wrapped up and entangled in the sensuous elements of the physical scene, the natural world, uh, to make sense of it. It's all bearing down of you. Here you're seeing blood everywhere, people screaming. Uh, the threat of violence against you is a thing. Um, you feel mortal terror, um, but it's only because of the remove that's made possible through this kind of aesthetic distance opened up by the artistic production that you can see the idea that is the truth of this historical moment brought forth, made vivid. And you can now understand it along the lines of multiple dimensions, which otherwise would have been opaque or obscure to you. Um, so does that make sense? Does this kind of painting as an example help with that? And or what? so this is an example I give too on a previous slide. Um, so as finite, so if we say that art deals not just in appearance, but specifically in deceptive appearance, then we must mean to contrast it with the immediacy of either external sense perception or internal emotion. The world of experience is true, the world of art is false. But Hegel says, no. <laughs> It's just this entire sphere of the empirical world, whether on its personal side, in terms of our emotions, or on its objective side, which we ought to rather call in a stricter sense than we apply the, war, the term to the world of art, merely a show or appearance, an even more unyielding form of deception. So here's my gloss on that. As finite human beings, we're constantly falling short of ourselves and of our highest ideals. In other words, Life is pretty profoundly shitty, right? We're constantly disappointed. Uh, we find this dissatisfying. But art is the place we can turn to to achieve the sort of satisfaction that we lose out on in the course of our normal experience. Uh, and this doesn't make art just a coping mechanism for dealing with that shitty existence. Uh, rather, art is the real, according to Hegel, insofar as it is infinite and unlimited. Everyday life, including political life, for example, is in some way false because it pretends to be what it can never be. So I use as an, as an example, Obama's message of hope and change. So if you're old enough to remember the Obama era, um, hope and change, if you recall all the iconic uh, kind of rhetorical posters everywhere, well, that quickly unraveled into actual life, in actual life, into a state of cynicism, <laughs> despair, and suspicion, <laughs> right? So uh, what we find captured in, to talk about those posters again, uh, the artistic ideal, once it's, it's given to material forces, which shape up our, ex our external historical lives, um, that ideal is always a disappointment. And so, so the 2008 yeah. economy collapse happened right after you got elected or right before? Yeah, it was right around the time, 2008, right? Yeah, um, I, remember, I, was in, I was in seventh grade when that happened, 2008. Wow. It was crazy. <laughs> You're making me feel quite old um, at this point. <laughs> My wife's 42, so 
when oh. I was a year she graduated. That's funny. I'm 42, actually. But... 1978. <laughs> woo, woo. 79 in my case. But... Oh, cool. So she's older than you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me feel I have... young. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, sure. So um, I wanted to wonder about like the difference between the two Lion King movies, like the Lion King and the Lion King remake. The second one is obviously like it's hyper realistic. That's the whole thing. It's supposed to be photorealistic. Would that mean that Hegel sees it as less real? Oh man, that's such a great question. <laughs> I'm really glad you asked that. Uh, I was thinking if I can find it real quick. Um, where's this? Where is it? I was thinking of, um, oh yeah, on page 413, where he talks about uh, Boltner's monkey. <laughs> uh, so there's this monkey that bit into pieces of a painted uh, cockchafer. A cockchafer is like a, a, a June beetle, like a May bug, but it looked so real, this representation of it, that the monkey tried to eat it, thinking it was a real insect. Um, and so we might praise the artist for making such a realistic thing, like in that Lion King uh, film. But Hegel would say, um, but if we only reflect a moment on such and other instances, we can only come to the conclusion that instead of praising these works of art because they have deceived even doves and monkeys, the foolish people ought to be condemned who imagine that the quality of a work of art is enhanced if they are able to proclaim an effect of the same so miserable as the supreme and last word they can say for it. In short, to sum up, we may state emphatically that in the mere business of imitation, art cannot maintain its rivalry with nature, and if it makes the attempt, it must look like a worm which undertakes to crawl after an elephant. So that's where I got that um, passage that we talked about earlier. But I was thinking of um, high-definition cinema so years ago when I guess the, not that long ago, but when the first Hobbit movie came out, I think it was Hobbit. I can't remember uh, the speed of the film, but it was <laughs> extremely fast such that when you're looking at it, and this is the case for high definition television or, or cinema, if you have a, an appropriate television at your home, it looks as if you're on the set in the studio. And there's something in my experience as a viewer alienating about that. Uh, there's something um, that blocks my aesthetic experience in a way that the less realistic, <laughs> the slower speed of the transition between frames and cinema accommodates. It looks less real, but that is somehow uh, able to facilitate the reality of my legitimate aesthetic experience. So there's something from this point of view about hyper-realism, which rather than um, making the work more successful as a work of art undermines uh, the very power in terms of aesthetic um, uh, uh, presentation for one's enjoyment of it as aesthetic. Um, so then there has to be art as this middle ground between the obtusely and overwhelmingly sensuous real and uh, the semblances that artists make as um, spirits in the pursuit of that. Um, so does, yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. Does that make sense, Raven? Yeah, thank you. Cool. All right, so we've gone over time. I apologize for that. Um, so I hope you guys have a good weekend. Thanks for the presentation. You guys were excellent, really nice work. We had a good conversation today. Um, so next week, we'll just talk about um, what we have left out in our conversation on these thinkers so far and um, the midterm paper. So. Um, I look forward to reading through your discussion forums and also grading your recent reflection papers, which I hope to finish by tomorrow. Um, all right, so are there any final questions or comments or anything? Of course. <laughs> Basically, um, well, I was thinking like, because I'm doing math, like- well, You all can go, I don't yeah, want to yeah. I'll stick around and chat, so. Thanks. Uh, it's like, philosophy is like, like you said, the inverted reality where it's like, it's very real because implications of philosophy, like, you know, it's like all these different like archetypes of emotional states, qualities of life, groups, community, like all these different things, metaphysical things do have huge implications on us. So metaphysical is real. And I was gonna say it's like, it's almost like philosophy is like, 
using like factorization of different ideas. Like you have this idea, like what could it divide out? Oh, so you have this idea, X, this idea is this idea. Then you factor it again, then you factor it again. It's like, then you like break all these things down. It's like, whoa, where are you? Holy shit. Then you just like add them together. It's just, you know, a variable and number. It's like, oh, like so much things like, just like, psh, like a factorization of ideas. So it keeps going, right? Uh, but uh, for it, like I need to like train my mind to do it. Like I have an inclination towards philosophy, but it's definitely uh, training my brain in a way that it's not completely comfortable with that enjoys, but it's like the exercise of it. It's not really natural for me. My girlfriend though, I told you, I read one page, she blasted off in a million directions. I'm like, wow, you should like totally do this because you would, it'd work for you. For me, it's like, I'm like, so like sensuous. I'm like one idea. Like, wait, you're throwing another idea on top of this idea. You're, it's, there's only two words in the sentence and you're already on four ideas. Like, how do you, how do you get four ideas out of three words? And like, she's just like piling them all up and expanding them all. And she's like, she's all about it. I was like, man, why, where were you this whole two years of my school? Well, that's awesome that you have someone at home to, you know, communicate ideas with and uh, grapple over these things. Right? Right. Last thing before I go, um, freaking she did like six years of Spanish in high school and like I did Spanish this last term, it killed me. It completely killed me. And like every time, I'm like, hey, I just learned this after like three months of study. She's like, oh, you're just, you're just learning that? That's so easy. She like knows everything. I'm like, babe, can you please help me with my Spanish? She's like, I don't know any Spanish. And at the end of the term, the second term, I like told her like my final and all that stuff and like all the stuff I learned. She's like, oh yeah, like I totally know all that. It's like, <laughs> that's helpful. Thank you. I'm glad you're your team spirit, but she did nothing. She just let me stop. You should try to plot um, beauty on a graph, and and even though it will be a fruitless endeavor objectively, subjectively, the resulting graphics will be able to be seen as beautiful by other people who don't know what they mean. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, kind of, you reminded me of Diotima's Ladder of Love. There, that would. Of the uh, way to visually graph the steps of beauty and towards beauty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And if you if you've seen the slides I prepared, the reading guide for Hegel, I share an image of one of William Blake's famous paintings, uh, Jacob's Ladder, which is like the ladder to heaven, um, as an example of romantic art. So that's an ideal that exceeds uh, the sensuous form that painting allows. Right? So that's an example of how we think about how we can get to this physical place, heaven, but depicted in a two uh, dimensional representation. Um, and so you can see that as parallel, I think, to Diotima's Ladder of Love account, which is kind of interesting. Uh -huh. Diotima. We talked about Diotima a bit in like the philosophy of sexuality. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So Devora or Dr. Shapiro, she teaches. Um, uh, the symposium in that, right? Yeah, so that's what we read in Plato in week two, uh, the selections of it at least. But all right, guys, um, I got to run. I have a, a meeting at 3.30, but this is awesome. Great. All right, see you, Professor. All right, see guys. you next week. Take care.